talks about toxic stress, brain development, parent-child interaction, et cetera, I'd, I'd ever heard, um, which was just really just amazing to see. I then had the privilege of getting to know her as we were both named Aspen Ascend Fellows uh, in the same class, and uh, we've had to now put up with each other for uh, multiple meetings and so on. So uh, I think you're in for a treat. She's doing some fantastic, innovative work that really gets at the, the basic science and then informs what we do um, in terms of uh, advising families and the programs and policies we set up. Uh, and she's really uh, uh, doing some fantastic cutting edge work in two generation solutions. So with that, I present you Sarah Watamura. Good morning, everyone. I have a hard time staying still, so they've given me this in case that happens. Um, but I'll see what I can do about staying up here. You really don't have to worry. I'm not hard to get off stage. There's been this like myth about that. It's really not true. Um, so uh, I'm very excited to be here. A lot of friends in the audience from Colorado where we're working hard on solutions for families. Um, and then a lot of new faces. I'm curious, could we get just a really quick, like, are you, if you're from Colorado, raise your hand. Okay, can we do quadrants, like Northeast, Southeast? Woo! Woohoo! Uh, the other side, the West? <laughs> okay, anybody I didn't cover? Midwest. Midwest, all right. I, we can never decide where we belong, you know, what are we? Um, Okay, that's great. Um, so lots of diversity across the country. I really appreciate that. Um, I'm go we have an amazing panel. So what we decided to do is I'm going to do about 40 minutes, and then we can do some questions um, to just give you some broad strokes. I actually won't be talking a lot about specific research because there, there isn't time. I want to give you more of a big picture frame. Um, and then we have three great um, panelists talking about uh, more specific uh, social-emotional uh, relationship uh, factors. So I think that should um, le uh, lead in really naturally. Um, but uh, we are going to start with a little bit of bad news because we have to have something, um, something to fix. So we're going to start with the bad news. Um, I just want to tell you briefly, I'm part of a, a research center. Um, I'm going to mention work from my colleagues. It would be impossible to do the kinds of uh, work that I'm going to talk about without lots of people. Um, so I just wanted to, to highlight uh, my colleagues in our Stress, Early Experience, and Development Research Center. Um, and I'm going to talk about these four sort of broad uh, topics today. So first, the evidence that early adversity can have lifelong consequences for both individuals and society. I think we all know this at a certain uh, level. Many of us have been exposed to um, research and information about this idea. Um, but just, just to pull that all into one place, then talking a little bit about resilience. What is resilience? Um, where do relationships fit into that? And what is the toxic stress framework? I think um, it has been a really useful framework, but it can be sometimes uh, misunderstood. And then why would all of this make sense um, has a lot to do with how impactful early experiences are sort of more generally um, for development. And then a couple of ideas about what we can do about it and where uh, Reach Out and Read fits into that um, in, my, in my opinion. So that's our, that's our plan. So we're going to start with the early adversity piece. Um, it turns out that experiencing uh, chronic severe stress can have a number of consequences for health. Um, I have pulled here, these are big, um, either population level studies, particularly well done studies. So I've pulled together the evidence that is really especially strong. Um, there are lots of other places where, where you'll see um, relationships. So we know that experiencing chronic stressful experiences uh, increases both your susceptibility and progression of illness. Um, that's definitely true for cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and infectious illness. It's also true for some types of cancer um, and probably for many other conditions. Part of the way that that happens, that you can end up with stress impacting um, health in significant ways, is because stressful experiences change your brain and body priorities in ways that increase the risk of risk. So a good example of that is if you experience stressful circumstances repeatedly over and over again, you're telling your body you're going to need energy, you're going to need it unpredictably, you don't know when that's going to happen, um, and you don't know whether you will have eaten recently, right? So if that's going to happen to you over and over again, you probably should store some energy. So of course we store our energy in, come on docs, store energy in fat, right. So if we store our energy in fat, 
Um, we can you know, get to it very quickly. And if we want it to go anywhere in the body, maybe we'll put it kind of right around the middle, like a little life raft, right? Um, so that could help if, in a situation where you're experiencing stressor after stressor after stressor and you need those um, calories, you need that fat to turn into energies, re energy really quickly. But that, of course, is a risk factor for cardiovascular disease, right? So a lot of the short-term adaptations that help an individual survive are the same things that result in these sort of long-term health consequences. Um, so it makes a lot of sense to think about it that way. Um, most of what happens when you experience stress can be best understood as a change in priorities. So we often say decreased immune function. It's a whole host of changes to the way the immune system works. Um, you also see things like increased metabolic syndrome, right? So that's an accumulation across uh, the lifespan. Um, we usually say stressful experiences can impair cognitive functioning. What I think it does is change what you attend to and what you remember, okay? So what are your priorities? What's important to you? If you've been stressed and threatened a lot, you're going to be very quick to notice threatening things in your environment and to respond to them and remember where and how those things happen to you. Um, it is also the case that uh, chronic stressful experiences increase the risk for mental health concerns, um, including depression, anxiety, and also in kids, um, what we call externalizing or act acting out behaviors. Um, that also makes a ton of sense, right? If you've been exposed to a lot of stressful experiences, you're allocating all your resources to monitor the environment for threat, right? What's the difference between fear and anxiety? Credible threat. Right? So if you are constantly surveying for threatening things in your environment, it's a short walk from that to start thinking that things are not actually threatening to you could be, right? So we see these elevated and this, this uh, going in and out of um, symptom criteria for depression, for anxiety, both conditions very comorbid. Um, we also have evidence that chronic stress exposure can accelerate aging. So that, ooh, it even works. It's very exciting. Um, so that uh, is a fun thing that we can measure now by looking at the M caps of our chromosomes, our telomeres. Um, it's pretty easy to do that. In, uh, we could take a sample from anyone uh, pretty easily. Um, and basically, as you probably know, every time a cell is replicated, a little bit of the non-coding DNA is, is uh, compromised. That's the N cap. Um, over time, when that entire end cap is gone, that, of course, then the coding DNA is compromised, right? So we look at the length of that end cap, that telomere, to see what the functional age of those cells in that sample are and estimate the functional age of that individual as compared to their chronologic age. So we all know people who uh, seem much uh, older than they are chronologically, right? And if you hang around in Colorado for very long, you will meet lots of people who seem much younger than they are chronologically, like passing you on 14ers with, you know, giant backpacks and stuff. Um, so uh, we can see the effects of stress, though, on these processes. As early as age nine, we can detect uh, telomere shortening in kids who have experienced uh, chronic stress. And there are differences at birth, OK? So we don't all start in the same place in terms of how fast we've set our maturational uh, timeline. And lots of things, lots of people working on trying to figure out what goes into that. Um, obviously, prenatal experiences. Um, but probably some carry over um, from previous generations via epigenetic mechanisms. Um, okay, so you probably know that smoking is bad for you. You should try to lose weight if you're over, uh, overweight. High blood pressure should be maintained. Uh, diabetes should be avoided and definitely treated. Um, these conditions collectively can take between five and 10 years off the lifespan. Um, childhood stress is thought to take up to 20 years off the lifespan. Um, so as a risk factor to identify um, families that might need extra resources, um, this one seems really important. Um, obviously, those things are not independent, right? I've already told you that if you experience lots of stressful uh, life events, you're more likely to carry extra weight, right? You're also more likely to smoke, more likely to have diabetes, as we've already discussed. However, again, if you're looking for an environmental, um, preventable public problem, this is a good uh, place to focus your attention. Um, that data comes from that number, that 20-year lifespan reduction, comes from the ACE study, which many of you are probably familiar with. Um, just as a quick review, it uh, was 17,000 participants, began in 1995 in Southern California. 
and they were Kaiser patients. It was a collaboration with the CDC, and what they did is they just simply asked people about what might have happened in their childhood. It's actually a 68-item questionnaire. Um, we talk about it as the uh, 10 ACEs, but that's not where they started. Um, so 68 items were asked of people retrospectively about their life experiences, and then they followed their, looked in their charts and followed their medical records across time. Um, and if people reported six or more adverse early childhood experiences on a maximum score of 10, they uh, were then uh, likely to lose uh, 20 years off their lifespan. Um, so that's where that number comes from. Four or more ACEs using this measurement strategy um, is associated with many chronic health conditions. And it's often described as a dose response function so that the more ACEs, the more um, concerns we have. I would say that's true, excepting from zero to one. Um, these are the things that go into the ACE score, the way it was originally conceptualized. People ask me all the time, why didn't they measure this? Why did they measure that? Um, I, don't, I think they just you know, did a study and then it ended up being really powerful, right? Um, so these are the things that are on the ACE instrument the way it's currently described. Verbal abuse or threat of physical abuse to the child, physical abuse, sexual abuse, lack of a supportive loving environment, neglect, parents ever separated or divorced, uh, mother, stepmother physically abused, and then a household member with substance abuse mental illness or incarceration. The, the household member is really important there. Um, it doesn't have to be a biologic parent, right? So when you think about people coming into the clinic, we're thinking about who is that kid exposed to in the home? Who is that child's family, broadly speaking, um, both for the positive they could bring and the possible risk factors. Um, so this is just an illustration uh, that you can look at from the CDC about that. If your life expectancy was 80 at the time of birth, it would now be 60 if you experience six or more uh, ACEs. But um, the is also a very important point here, which is that when people lose 20 years off their lifespan, it's an enormous cost to us as a society. We lose their most uh, high income years, their generative years, their giving back to the community years. Um, and all together, that takes an enormous uh, economic toll. The yellow is showing you the economic toll from lost productivity. So most of the cost to us as a society is lost potential. Um, and when you think about kids, um, imagining what all the things they could be, all the things they could become if they were given um, the right inputs and environment, you know, t taking that away from them, stealing that from them, and stealing it from us. All the things they could have discovered, they could have made, they could have, um, you know, uh, things that we couldn't even imagine, right, is what our kids um, will be doing when they're um, in their later years. Okay, so just as an illustration then, these are two sort of hypothetical maturational timelines an individual could be on. Um, if someone experiences lots of stress in the prenatal period, we of course know that leads to preterm birth. If people experience lots of stress in the early childhood period, um, they're more likely to hit puberty early. Uh, if they hit puberty early, they're more likely to childbear early. And this trajectory is associated with this early death um, you know, outcome. So it's an accelerated timeline. It's an adaptive accelerated out, uh, timeline, right? Because if there was a war or a famine or a meteor hit, hit the planet, like some of us have to get down to business, right? We can't all wait till we're 40 to have kids. Um, so I think it is an important fact that our species retain the ability to adapt to very negative circumstances. However, if lots of people are doing this, then we don't have as many people on the green trajectory where they are um, experiencing a full-term birth, a long childhood where they can develop slowly and learn all the things they need to uh, know. They can uh, hit puberty later. <laughs> uh, they can childbear uh, when they are in stable relationships and have good jobs. Um, and then they can produce all across their adulthood, contribute to all the ways that adults contribute to our society, pay their taxes, and then, you know, around 100, they could just, like, die in their sleep and not cost a lot of money on the back end. That'd be great. Um, so, you know, that's kind of what we're hoping for, right? When we look at a new baby, we're not hoping that they're on the red trajectory. So how can we help individuals um, life that we hope they can, they can have? Um, that's kind of what we're talking about here. Um, so uh, this is just basically what I just said. Um, there is ACE data available at the state level um, for approximately a little over 30 uh, states and territories. These are data from Colorado. 
the basic uh, story has been replicated in state after state after state. So some people wondered, was there something special about California? Um, was there something special about the 90s? Um, that does not appear to be the case. So um, the middle numbers, the twos and threes jiggle around, and which ACEs people in endorse jiggle around. But the proportion of people who say they've had none stays around a third, and the proportion of people that say they have four or more uh, stays around 12 to 15-ish percent across different states and different samples. Um, and uh, these are uh, the ACE instrument that's used now is shorter, and it doesn't include neglect. Um, and it does include domestic violence perpetrated by anyone, so not just against the mother. Um, you can see the types of things that are frequently reported. Of course, parental divorce is high on the list, um, but also emotional abuse um, and uh, substance use in the home, abuse in the home are also very high, uh, frequently reported. Um, I tend to think of these as, as hurdles because they've already happened. We're talking about adults, right? So these are things that have already happened to people. Um, if we look at this is setting the odds to one, so equalizing any uh, genetic or other contribution, setting the odds to one for these disorders. Um, folks with one to three ACEs are between 1.74 and 2.63 times more likely to have arthritis, disability, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or depression. Um, and four or more ACEs was associated with a two to five fold increase in every chronic health condition asked about uh, on this questionnaire. And these uh, analyses were controlling sex, age, race, ethnicity, and education level, which were all the demographic factors that were associated with the ACE score. So this is just Colorado data. You can look at it from your own state. Many of you will be able to look at it from your own state. Um, you can find out whether your state collected that data. Not all the states have analyzed the data they collected, so you can ask for that. It is public. Um, this is just showing you, this is a Head Start sample. So Head Start is a federally funded intervention um, that families qualify based on their income. Uh, so we know nothing else about families walking in the door than that they are experiencing low income at that time. Um, we asked in a sample of uh, early Head Start families about ACEs um, and the uh, proportion of families reporting four or more ACEs in the parents was 32%. So uh, three times, you know, two to three times higher uh, than, than you see in the general population and uh, only 19% of folks reporting no adverse childhood experiences exposure. So probably, depending on where your clinics are located or the populations you're serving, your, uh, your exposure rates could be really quite high. Um, and this is just Head Start, right? All we know is that they're, they're experiencing low income. So if you have a higher risk population, um, of course, your rates would go up from there. I just wanted to tell you that this matters. These are mom's ACE score and every other variable we measured it was associated with. So current economic situation, um, mom's current depression and anxiety, mom's parenting stress, mom's evaluation of baby. Uh, these were babies in this study. Um, parents' ability to be cognitively flexible, which is a very important uh, executive function. Um, and kids' current presentation of symptoms for internalizing and externalizing symptoms. Okay, so the way the ACE story is usually told and the way I just told it is just like this. Um, if your risk for depression was if, uh, in the population is two, about two in 10 um, with no ACEs, if you had five or more ACEs, it's six in 10 individuals. So uh, quite a significant increase. But what about those people? Um, that's what I think many, many folks, we've all kind of gotten indoctrinated now with this bad news story. And many of us, um, for a number of years have been trying to figure out what do we do now? What do we do about this? How do we prevent it? What can we do when people have already experienced a lot of adversity? What are the levers? And so that would um, involve trying to understand what's going on with these four uh, folks. Okay, so that brings us to resilience. Um, often resilience is sort of imagined in our country as this like rose in the desert, everything is terrible and somehow this amazing delicate flower um, flourishes. Um, that's not what the science base suggests. What the science base suggests is that we all have uh, an equation of the demands on us and the resources available to us. And if the scales tip in one way or the other, you have better or worse outcomes. So if we measure resources carefully, um, including individual resources, family resources, community resources, um, uh, things that are happening uh, in the world, like is it a recession, um, is there a major war, um, we can usually account for the outcomes that kids have. It's just that we don't often measure resources super carefully. Um, 
and across a, a quite a large uh, variety of research approaches, it appears that our relationships are at the core of the most valuable resources we have to put in that, in that side of the scale. Um, for little kids, that's often their parents. It doesn't have to be their parents. Um, and for adolescents, you often hear about a coach, a teacher, a neighbor, somebody who invested in that child. So um, we are talking about an individual that the child would identify as consistently available and, and supportive. Um, and that's really all that, that needs to, to be there. Um, it doesn't have to be um, a parent. So uh, these uh, three gentlemen, uh, some, you probably know them maybe in, in that order. So uh, Jack Shankoff, um, Tom Boyce, and Bruce McEwen. Um, I, I keep meaning to actually ask them this, but I sort of imagine that they were sitting around one day and were like, hey, we know a whole bunch of stuff nobody else does. Um, <laughs> maybe we should like call it something. Um, but Jack has a long history of um, trying to make information accessible across sectors. Um, he was one of the... Uh, authors of Na uh, Neurons to Neighborhoods, which if you, even if you don't, didn't read it or don't remember it, it's had a huge impact on you, um, which was basically how we understand how important early brain development is. Um, and so that has penetrated the fabric of our society in, in really amazing ways. Um, so what they did is they organized a whole bunch of literature, animal models, um, you know, big population studies, mentoring studies, intervention studies, and tried to simplify what is it that we know about the way stress works um, and what, um, what sort of the key uh, levers might be. And so um, first, this, is, this always gets dropped off, so we're going to do it first. First, Challenge is critical for normal development. Having your body respond to stressful experiences is necessary for survival. It is necessary for goals that you think are important, right? Turning off your stress response system is not the idea here. It is not the goal to sit around and do what's legal in Colorado all day. Um, it is you want to challenge your body. You want to practice using these systems. You want to use them in supportive contexts, right? Where you don't get overwhelmed when you're little. But that's not the same as not having a challenge or a stressor. Um, and it mean, you do want your body to do this work. Um, then the next category is called uh, tolerable stress. So this is when the situation is pretty serious, something pretty serious is going on, um, but the child is not taking a big hit for that. They're not absorbing all the cost of that in their body and brain because they have adults they can rely on, okay? And then toxic stress is when the child experiences strong and frequent activation of their stress management systems because they are taking the hit, right? There's not someone else to do it for them. They would vastly prefer that you do it for them. But if they need to, they're going to do this, right? Because they're adaptive little creatures. So they're going to turn it all on, reorganize their brain and body. But if they do that, if they reorganize their brain and body priorities to survival, then they're going to get on that red line, right? And then we're concerned about their long-term outcomes in every domain, in academic, um, relationships, in, and in health. Um, so. There isn't a list of things that you could say are toxic stressors. It doesn't work that way. It's about context, right? So ACEs and toxic stress are not the same, even though people use them very uh, interchangeably. Um, ACEs are a list of things that suggest negative events are happening and buffering potential is compromised. So it, it's hard to imagine, probably for any of us, to imagine a situation where a child is being chronically abused and also buffered, right? But it could happen. It could happen. Um, so we look for things like extreme poverty, recurrent physical or emotional abuse, chronic neglect, severe maternal depression, uh, parental substance abuse, and family violence because they are suggestive that it's both a stressful and a low buffering environment, right? But we still have to get in there and find all that out. Okay, um, we care about the toxic stress um, bucket because we think it disrupts the way the brain is growing, changes the brain's priorities. Um, it does affect other organ systems all throughout the body. Um, it, it sets stress management systems. It sort of calibrates the system to what the world is going to be like um, in ways that can have consequences for how kids hand handle subsequent challenges. Um, and altogether, these changes to the body have consequences for health um, and well-being that go into the adult years. 
Um, so I sometimes think it's helpful to have an example. So if you imagine, for wherever you live in the country, a uh, two-parent family, um, relatively isolated from other adults, uh, with a single child, and depending on where you live, you can estimate the probability that one adult is incarcerated, deported, uh, deployed, or hospitalized for a major illness, okay? So one of those things happens to one of the parents. All of those share a few features. What do they share? Absence, excellent. What else For the, from the family's perspective? They're unpredictable and uncontrollable. Okay, so those are the worst kinds of stressors for health because you can't get a handle on it. Okay? So they're unpredictable, uncontrollable, and of unknown duration from the family's perspective. Maybe somebody knows when that person's deployment is going to end, but <laughs> that family probably doesn't firmly know right, when they're coming back. Okay, so the other parent, let's imagine, in one cir circumstance gets on the phone, calls all their neighbors, like, look, we're going to need some help, um, you know, goes to the child's school, says this is what's going on with us, um, is able to, you know, get some extra resources, um, and is totally present emotionally for that child. We would call that a tolerable, but not a toxic stressor. It's a major event for that family. It's hard for that family. But it is not toxic for the child, because from the child's perspective, their community, their system rallied around them and supported them. Take the exact same situation, uh, family is isolated, one parent is deployed, deported, incarcerated, or hospitalized. Um, the other parent cannot access those resources for whatever reason. Maybe because they've become really distressed. Maybe because nobody in their community is able to help them. Um, and so they do not have an influx of support. In fact, maybe they lose resources because mom or dad can't um, get all the hours at work and get kid from school and home and do all the things they need to do. And so they start to lose financial resources. Maybe their housing becomes unstable. And all of those stressors combined make it hard for that parent who's left to sit down on the floor and read with baby, right? To take that time, to build that relationship, to be present for them. And they don't maybe even know that that's the most important thing they could be doing, right? Because they're trying to keep the roof over their heads and trying to keep everything together. Um, that's when we start to see a toxic stress. That's when we start to see the child reorganizing their priorities to deal with it. We start seeing kids worrying about what's going, what's going to happen for dinner and figuring out how to get to school and doing all the kinds of things that uh, many, many kids do that are survival, uh, survival traits. Okay, so you just figure out where you are in a given family. I know you don't have, you have like 39 seconds or something. So you figure out where they are in this map and what can you change? Can you make the situation less stressful? Can you make it less unpredictable and uncontrollable? Can you connect them to resources? Can you give them some control? Can you support the parent that's left or the adult who's turned up in the clinic to be that buffer for that child? Can you help them understand how important that is? Okay, so those are all changeable things. And I would advocate for an approach that's, you know, any, all and all of the above. Everything you can change, you can change. Uh, you should go for. All right, so all of this makes sense because early experiences are particularly impactful. We have these big, amazing brains, right? So we're born um, with unlimited potential. Um, we could go, it appears, to Pluto. Um, did you see the new pictures? They're very cool. Um, so, you know, maybe one of, one of the kids being born today is going to go to Pluto. I mean, what do we know? Um, they could speak any language, live anywhere in the world, have any career, um, will likely develop technologies we've never even dreamed of, right? All of that is possible because our brain is not prescribed at birth, right? It is not defined. So it has the ability to take in information from um, its in environment. That starts in the prenatal period. What is this world like? What's possible here? Um, what am I going to do? And taking all of that input in, what kinds of languages are spoken to me? What kinds of uh, in, uh, emotions do I experience and, and see? Um, what kinds of resources do I have? What's my nutritional environment? Um, so, and we are learning machines from probably close to the moment of conception until the day we die. We are made to learn. So that's what they're doing. They're learning and adapting and calibrating to their world. Um, so a lot of, that's my daughter in her chicken hat. Um, that uh, a lot of that calibration, what is the world like, um, gets, happens in the first three years. So by between, um, we can't obviously measure a lot of this in the womb, 
But by the time kids are three, we see the functional capabilities for many important systems in place. So for vision and hearing, uh, makes sense, but things like language, emotion control, uh, symbol learning, relationships, um, those are also, not that they're not changeable later, but the child has used that period, that prenatal to first three year period, to calibrate, right? So here they are at three. Um, so these are some other newborns. I sometimes take the elephant picture out because people get grossed out, but I figured you guys could handle it. Um, that elephant is wearing her placenta, okay, and walking. Let's just think about that for a second, okay? <laughs> Um, so most mammals walk at birth over to their mother and initiate nursing. Who has a kid? Parents? Yeah, not so much, right? Okay, so that's us. We are leisurely about that business. Um, we take our time to uh, walk uh, 12 to 15 months, right, before kids are walking independently. Um, although, you know, breastfeeding is amazing, it is certainly not initiated simply um, and for first-time moms and first-time babies, right, that can be a pretty bumpy road. Um, so we are very different. We, we have these um, really fragile, uh, really underdeveloped babies um, at birth. So that's going to give them every possible capability, but it also means that they need extra care and attention. That, it, you know, doesn't happen. I don't think, um, you know, that a goat is going to Pluto on its own volition. Um, we could, I could be wrong about that, something could change, um, right? But, they are, but they, they are more developed and able to do their sort of basic things early. So it's a trade-off. Um, this is one of my favorite all-time studies um, from the 80s. Um, and that's a real picture from the, from the study. Um, so what they did in this study is they asked, you may know this, but if you don't, it's worth putting in your back of your brain. Um, they asked pregnant moms to read a passage of The Cat in the Hat. Okay, everybody knows the cat in the hat. Anybody not know how the cat in the hat goes? Okay, it's important because the cat in the hat is extremely repetitive, right? So one page to the next shares a lot of features. Um, so what they did is they asked uh, uh, moms to read one, one you know, double-sided page uh, twice a day from seven and a half months of pregnancy until birth. And then right after birth, they played an audio recording of mom reading that passage and another page of the same book to the baby. Okay, what babies had to do is, let's just, we're going to take half of the babies first for clarity. Half of the babies had to suck on that pacifier to hear the passage. Okay, so they had to suck really hard, and then they could hear mom read the one they heard in the womb versus the other one that was very similar. The other half of the babies had to suck less in order to hear the passage that they heard in the womb. They did whatever they had to do to hear the one they heard in the womb. So I can't think of more clear evidence that they learned, right? Because they, it's so specific. It's not mom's voice that's controlled. It's not the, you know, the, the sound of it. It's, not, it's the specific difference in the words between the two pages. It's amazing. I love this study. Plus, how cute is that? I don't know why they have to have giant earphones. Um, all right, so uh, this is another uh, very famous uh, line of research. Um, so babies can hear uh, every language, oh, every sound of every human language, of course, at birth, right? Because they could be born anywhere and they could be adopted anywhere. Obviously, they have to be able to do that. It turns out that if you could hear all that, it's quite a cacophony. Um, the possible sounds in every human language in the world is a lot of sounds. Um, so what babies do is they tune in and start to be able to hear only the sounds to which they are exposed, which makes great sense for learning language. And that happens between about 10 and 12 months of age. So if you test them under 10 months of age, they can hear sounds that you cannot, right, from languages that you do not know. Um, and if you test them after that, they no longer hear those very specific sounds that they aren't going to hear. So it isn't going to work like across, say, say, romance languages that have a lot of similar sounds. You need to be talking about sounds that don't exist in their environment um, to drop out, but uh, that, that does happen. And is part of the base for why, ultimately, if you're not exposed to a language, you know, before we can argue about what age, it's, it's very, very difficult, if not impossible, to have a native sounding accent, right? Because you don't hear it. You don't hear those distinctions. All right, uh, one last language example, since we're at a reading um, event. Um, the uh, kids, when they're in their fast mapping stage, which uh, varies, the timing of that varies a little bit, but say two to three-ish, um, kids can learn a new word with a single exposure. Um, adults can only learn a new word with about eight to 10 exposures. We're pretty bad at it, so the word of the day thing isn't gonna work. 
Um, and we've probably all experienced in our professional lives, um, maybe even recently, some new acronym, word thing you're supposed to say, right? And you just can't get it, can't get it right. You have to actually stop and attend and learn it or else you're not gonna do it. Okay, so kids can do this really fast, which is very important because they don't have a language to build onto, they have to make one. Um, but this only works in a particular social setting. So it works when the child is given a label for something that they're interested in and that is at the right level of abstraction um, for what they want to do. Um, so that's why when you're helping parents with book, giving out books, showing them how to read, what you're really showing them is how to do it, right? Not to do it. We don't want parents to like insist on turning every single page and read from the front to the back. That would be, that's what adults do when they don't know what else to do. Um, what we want them to do is let the kid chew on the corners and you know, point at the pictures and shake it if that's interesting or whatever they're doing at, at, if they're six months old or a year old or two years old or whatever because eventually when you hand a book to, you know, I have a two-year-old now, if you hand him a book, he'll go climb on somebody's lap and open the book. Like he knows what's gonna happen. Uh, how do you get to that stage? You, you have to let them chew on it first. Um, so in order to, um, I couldn't say, for example, you know, some very complicated word to a little kid and expect them to pick that up. And it probably wouldn't work if you haven't tried this it, to try to force them to learn a label for something they're not interested in, right? That also doesn't work. But if they ask you, what's that? Which they do like 500 times a day, maybe, when they're in this stage, right? Even when they don't know very many other words, what that, what that, what that? Um, you um, have this great opportunity to give them the label that then becomes part of their permanent vocabulary forever. So um, my um, fun example of that is my now almost four-year-old, um, when she was two, we were walking to school and she, um, she has a very, some people know this, she has a very, very strong personality. Uh, I was walking her to school. She had to be walked because if she was driven, you know, it was Meltdown City. So we would walk the few blocks to school and there was, there, it's a big bush. These people in our neighborhood have this huge bush and it was flowering. And so she pointed at the bush and said, what that? And I, uh, you know, on any given day, it could have been like, once again, I'm gonna be late to my first meeting and, you know, it's a flower, like, let's keep going, you know, whatever. I happened that day to have my good parenting hat on and looked over and saw a beautiful hibiscus. And I said, oh baby, that's a hibiscus. Okay, so the thing has never flowered again. I don't know what happened to that bush, <laughs> but every time, so it's been two years, every time we go by there, she points to it and says hibiscus. She asks me about new flowers, if that's like a hibiscus. That word, I mean, that's a very specific word. If I had said flower, she wouldn't have spoken to me for like another 24 hours, because obviously, mommy, I know it's a flower, right? Um, so she needed that level of abstraction to something she wanted, but then it's there, now that's her word forever, right? And hibiscus is a word a lot of people don't know, right? You can imagine there's probably lots of people who don't know the name of that flower. So that could have not happened. Um, all right, it's, I've given you lots of language examples. I just wanted you to know um, it's also very true for other things like learning emotions, um, recognizing faces, expressing emotions appropriately. Um, that also depends on input at the right time um, and a diversity of input. So uh, you can um, pull this. How are we doing on time? You haven't moved at all. You're a very, you're a very st still person. How, how do you do that? <laughs> okay. <laughs> you learned it early. <laughs> I mean, I'm having trouble and I have like a little cage here. You know, like I have this much, I feel like a lion in the zoo. Um, okay, so what's that? His? Oh. Well, uh, anyway, okay, so I have, time, I have time to tell you this example because we have like tons of time. Uh, so the, um, the way this works is babies, okay, so first of all, who knows a grown up who does not know how to express their emotions? Okay, right. Okay, who does not understand other people's emotions? Right, so we fail at this, right? We fail at this. Okay, do we know any adults who are typically developed who do not know the days of the week? No. What do we do in every single preschool classroom every single day? Right. Do we do, I wonder what's on your face? Why are you feeling that way? Let's talk about it. Our good programs do, right? Are good programs too. We need to do more of that because kids have to learn how to read expressions, how to 
understand how that connects to what can they do about it? How can they express it appropriately? How can they talk about it? That's a lot to learn. It starts right away at birth. So the most compelling thing for a newborn to look at is a face. They will try to look at even a scrambled image of something sort of face-like. Um, they stare at faces. They love faces. Um, and uh, that, uh, and they can see exactly the distance that they would be if they were held nursing is exactly how far they can see at birth. So not only are they super interested in faces, that's the, exactly the stimulus they can take in at birth when their vision is uh, not so good. Um, so, so it starts immediately that they're scanning and trying to understand faces. There's actually very cool studies where they track exactly what they look at back and forth between the eyeballs and stuff. Um, and then, um, then that's input that every single baby needs. They need to see faces, right? So do you ever see people feeding a baby with a bottle in a seat like that? Right. And I'm not saying every single time you have to be amazing and perfect, right? Let's not do that to moms. Um, but that's a real opportunity, right? And it's hard for parents. You're going to hear, I think, someone talk about this. It's hard for parents not to look on their phone and do other stuff. And like, baby is staring at your face, right? That's what baby's doing while they're eating. It's a great opportunity for that interaction. And no, you can't do that 15 times a day when you're nursing or at four in the morning. But you could do it a few of those times, right? And try to give them that input that they're looking for. And then the other thing that differs across cultures and then across individuals is the way we express our emotions. And so babies have to learn about that. What are the expression rules in my culture? And how are emotions expressed in my family? And so they need to experience a diversity of expression. So this is why when you approach a baby, what do you do? Anyone want to give us an example? Right, like a fool, right? We're like fools. Um, and some of us even do it to dogs, right? Let's admit it. Um, but you get right up in their face, right? Get right up in their face. Hi! You're so cute. Oh, look at that nose, right? We did exaggerated expression, exaggerated voice, and they love it, and they smile at you, and everybody feels good. Um, so that is giving them that intense exposure to those expressions. So if adults have a lot going on, most adults try to kind of hold it together, right, in front of kids. They're pulling all that affect in. And so kids are not getting that intense exposure that they need and not learning as much as they could about the diverse range of emotions. Um, so I think you could actually talk about that in both ways. I think it's important for kids to know when people have negative emotions, how to process them safely. Um, I don't think we need to protect them from that. But they need to see those high positive affect expressions to get that full range under control. Okay. Um, all right, so this all starts super, super early. Um, seven weeks gestation, which is five weeks post-conception, um, neurons are already talking to each other, um, stretching out their little synapses and trying to reach each other, uh, which is pretty amazing. If you haven't ever looked at it, there's um, you know those little uh, sped up videos where you can see that happening. Um, and of course, you probably know this, but most of uh, the, the highest number of neurons are present at birth. Um, and then the number of synapses uh, peaks in the first year of life. So that's the connection of every neuron to every other neuron. Um, it starts out as an organic sort of, you know, of course, the things that are closer together, wire together first. Then it's kind of everything to everything. That turns out to be not efficient, right? So if we had magic way to connect everybody's smartphone right now. Like, let's say I told you I had an app that could sync all our smartphones, and wouldn't it be great because we'd be able to connect with all these people? And you might buy, buy it for like 10 seconds, right? And then you'd go out on break to call somebody, and you'd be like, who are all these people? What do I do with all this? So you would use what on your phone to make that work? Delete. Well, there's that. Um, well, how do you decide, how do you call people quickly on your phone? Favorites or recents, right? OK, that's what the baby's brain is doing. Okay, It's making tight, fast connections between its favorites and its recents. It's not dropping every other connection forever. It's not impossible that it can do those things later. But it's making tight, fast connections between the things it uses all the time. If you want to explain that to a parent, point to their cell phone. Everybody understands that. Um, that's what they're doing. So what do you want their favorites to be? right? What do you want them to be able to get to fast and quick? and all the time, and what are the things that are maybe not so important or you wish they didn't have to do? Um, so, uh, okay, and again, that starts prenatally. Um, 
And uh, there is some evidence that uh, the negative inputs are also embedded pretty early. Um, so in this particular study uh, by my colleague Alicia Davis, um, what they did is they, um, they collected a lot of data from pregnant moms, including stress hormones, um, all across pregnancy. You probably know that uh, cortisol should increase across pregnancy, so it's quite high by the end. Uh, it turns out if it's high early, that's not great. Um, if it gets high enough, it can cross uh, the placenta. It doesn't at lower, uh, lower levels. Um, so what they did is they just measured their blood levels um, of cortisol at several time points. And using the early time point, um, they separated moms into two groups. So moms with higher or lower um, levels of uh, cortisol in the early uh, part of pregnancy. And then when the babies were born, they had a heel step blood draw, medically necessary procedure. Um, and so what uh, they did is they ran over to the hospital. So they were there when the heel stick blood draw happened. Um, that is uh, the first stressor that's universally applied to all babies. Even though it's medically necessary, it's also aversive. Um, it usually takes a few minutes to squeeze all the blood out that's needed for the sample. Um, and so they, you can measure how the baby reacts to that, um, and you can also measure their hormones in reaction to that stressor. So it's a way for us to look at the way babies handle a stressor right at birth. Um, and what they did is they found that, um, so that, sorry, the two yellow lines are basically look indistinguishable, but um, the two uh, groups were identical in the first about minute and a half. So all the babies had a big reaction to the heel stick blood draw. They didn't like it. Um, but the babies who, whose moms had low circulating cortisol early in pregnancy went right back down to baseline. Um, the babies who had moms with the high circulating cortisol levels did not come back to baseline while we were watching. So we would call that vigilance. Um, they've been insulted. They've had a poke that hurts. So they've been threatened. And they are maintaining their vigilance um, to see what's going to happen next. Um, they are doing that more if they experienced more stress hormones in utero. Of course, lots of things could contribute to that. There could be genetic factors, there could be other prenatal factors, but we, we know that they differ at birth in how they handle that first stressor. Then if you look at those kids uh, when they're six to eight years of age, they're more likely to be anxious and depressed. And the girls had larger right amygdala volumes, so their brain is supporting what they're doing, which is monitoring their environment for threat cues. Um, amygdala does lots of things, but that's one of its jobs. Uh, so kind of a consistent story here. They're getting potentially, if it isn't a genetic difference, they're getting primed, right, in utero that it might be a threatening environment and therefore they should maintain that threat vigilance um, in all the ways that we do that. So behaviorally um, and also uh, with neural support. They're still following these kids into adolescence, so there will be more to be learned. There is actually, though, some interesting data where higher cortisol near the end of pregnancy was, positive, was associated with positive outcomes, so better uh, reading scores and stuff later. So it isn't like a single story. It's just that you want it high when you need it high. Uh, this is a different study uh, done in Oregon, and what they did in this study is they, um, uh, they wanted to image the babies. And so they put them in a scanner. In order to put the babies in a scanner, of course, they had to be sleeping. So they asked parents about how much fighting was going on at home. They had a rating of uh, conflict in the home. And then they put the babies in the scanner, and they listened to either neutral or angry adult voices. Um, the babies whose parents reported more fighting at home had more active brains to angry versus neutral voices while they were asleep. Okay. So this, I thought, was a really big deal finding um, because babies have lots of jobs while they're sleeping um, other than tracking their environment for danger. But listening for adult, angry adult voices or looking at angry adult faces is a very good cue for kids about bad things to come. Um, and there's actually a pretty big body of research looking at uh, the ways in which kids who experience more adversity do that. So they're faster, for example, at telling when an adult's uh, voice or face changes from neutral to negative. Um, they can do it in microseconds, and kids with less exposure take a long time to notice that somebody's gotten angry. So they take you know, more like a few seconds before they notice. And if you're talking about uh, moving toward a survival um, trajectory over a, a slow maturational trajectory, threat detection is at the top of your list, right? So being able to do that within microseconds could mean that you can get out of the room and out of notice before um, you become the target. Thank you. He's still, like, he just moved his arms. <laughs> it's really amazing. 
Okay. Uh, all right. So, um, any questions about any of that? No. Okay. We're gonna have time for a discussion, but um, okay. So. Many people, um, most popularly uh, Nadine Burke Harris, have tried to reframe uh, this uh, toxic stress or adversity story as a public health problem, um, which is what it is, right? It is a public health problem. It's costing us as a society. It's preventable. Um, so if it's a public health problem, then what it needs is community buy-in and understanding, uh, which is why uh, people like me and Depeche go everywhere we're asked. Uh, it takes effective policy, and how amazing that we had our governor here this morning. Um, it takes government support and perhaps regulation. Uh, it takes business and legal support. We have to talk to all our partners about how to get this done. It takes practical solutions, so we need our CBOs and NGOs out there coming up with creative solutions, testing innovative models, and getting rewarded for doing that. Um, we need knowledgeable screening and referral by doctors, nurses, teachers, anyone who has frontline contact with parents. Um, and we need an active, flexible, innovative research community who can adapt to what we're learning in our, in our practice. Um, and of course, it takes all of us, right? If we're gonna solve a public health problem, it needs a public health um, approach. So that sounds pretty overwhelming when you're thinking about uh, something, uh, any problem, right? But as Nadine points out, um, we've already done it successfully for other things. A great example is lead. So, we found out that lead damages brains, kids' brains, right? So we got it out of the paint. Re everybody had to re work, remake their engines, right? We have government regulation that requires that. It's out of the gasoline. And people know how to screen for it. Kids are screened. Um, we go into old derelict buildings and strip the paint down. Um, and, uh, you know, there's uh, absorbent um, efforts to try to absorb the lead. Um, mostly prevention though, right? Most of the effort is prevention. So it sounds like a huge ask, but that was a government, business, um, you know, education, medical, and community solution. Um, lead is a little easier to understand, but it's also cross-correlated with all the same things uh, that adverse childhood experiences are, um, and not limited to those things, right? So um, the chance that you've experienced adversity is increased if your family um, is low income, for example, but it's a modest correlation, you know, it's not enormous. Um, uh, substance abuse in the home, domestic violence in the home, abuse in the home is happening across the income spectrum. Um, and kids are not able to talk about that across the income spectrum. Um, and if you are going to screen, you should screen every single family that comes in the door and not make assumptions about it. Um, I frequently don't get screened and I always ask. Um, for that, I mean, you don't actually know. I realize that I'm talking a lot, but <laughs> you still don't know what's going on uh, in our house, right? You have no idea. Um, so thinking about how we do that, um, and if we're going to screen, are we going to do, or we're just going to screen? Because I feel like if you ask parents if these really terrible things are happening, and then you nod and file the piece of paper, um, it's worse than not asking in some ways, right? Because it's like they finally told you this horrible thing is happening, and that was the end of it from your perspective. So, or they got a referral um, and not, uh, not much more than that. Okay. Um, so just back to reminding you that you can tackle both ends of the spectrum. You can try to decrease the stress. You can also try to increase the buffering. It's an and or. It's not an or, it's an and solution. Um, so definitely trying to tackle both of those ends. Um, what are decreasing stressful circumstances look like? Uh, strengthening families, for sure, community support, um, poverty alleviation and policy changes, but increasing buffering is a lot of the same stuff. So strengthening families, uh, integrated uh, behavioral health, um, parenting support, taking, realizing that every single baby born is our future, our collective future, right? Every single baby born is something that every single one of us should invest in if we want you know, cool solutions to the problems that haven't happened yet and, you know, somebody to take care of us when we're old, right? Um, so it's about, it's about our future. Um, we also know that early uh, is cheaper and easier. Um, Heckman uh, is famous Nobel laureate of uh, economics who's worked on this problem using um, uh, quite a few data sets. I recently saw him speak. He's hilarious. He, you know, like puts up lots of numbers and formulas and stuff and jumps around and, um, 
cute and nerdy. Um, and then, uh, but he did this whole presentation with all these numbers and then someone said, well, what do you think the most important thing is? What do you think he said? Love. Um, and, and quite serious, not, not, you know, not being, he was like, well, I think it's love. Like, does, do they have, you know, is, is, are they getting love in, in the home? Um, so uh, his approach points out that investing as early as possible is what uh, saves money. Um, reduces social costs and strengthens the economy. Um, it, and it is about providing resources to children and their families. Um, you can, by combining early education and early health and nutrition, you can affect health, which is pretty amazing. Um, uh, prevent chronic disease, promote healthier lifestyles, uh, reduce healthcare spending and strengthen the economy. Um, and then this is just a graphic of how much uh, time, effort, and money it might cost to implement a solution at different times in the lifespan. Um, so the cheapest being prenatally um, and more expensive in adulthood, but never impossible. So I actually don't think we should interpret this to mean we give up on anyone. Um, so Reach Out and Read is an amazing opportunity. It's a strengths-based, positive intervention. Who doesn't want to be given a free book? I mean, that's awesome. It reaches kids where they are. They're already coming to you, right? You don't have to go out looking for them like we do um, for other kinds of work. Um, it's a trusted relationship. They've already come to you and asked um, for your advice. Um, it's already a context where you talk about things you don't talk about with other people, like who's sleeping where and stuff like that, right? Um, it focuses attention on the most important ingredients for health, right? relationships. It focuses the attention. Parents are there to get information about their child's health and development from you. And if you tell them that their relationship, taking time to sit on the floor and play and read with their baby is top of the list, right? They're going to believe you. Okay. And, and, you know, I know it's prime real estate in there in the clinic's office, but like, do we need to be screening for rickets? Okay. Um, it's, uh, it's a modeling opportunity. It's a great time for you to show parents how to do this if they're not coming naturally to that, right? So that they don't have to think that they're supposed to read from start to finish or if they don't know how to read that they can't read with their children. Um, and it's a great assessment opportunity for you. It gives you so much information without having to um, anyone even notice that you're doing it. And of course, it reduces stress and increases buffering when parents have parents and children have these positive experiences together daily. Um, so they know they're supposed to read. I just looked at some recent data where every single parent was reporting that they were reading to their kid like seven days a week. I'm like, no, you're not. Um, so they know the right answer, right? But they may not know how to do it. They may not know what we mean when we say read to your baby. Um, that it doesn't mean put them in front of a Kindle that is an audio book. It doesn't mean... Um, you know, just get to the end of the book so that, you know, everybody can go to bed. It doesn't mean that it's a negative in context. I'm, all of these are real, I'm not making this up. These are all real things that happen because parents get one message. Okay, I've got to read. Okay, come on, we've got to read our book. Let's get through the book. You know, come on, we've got to turn the page. Okay, that's not what we were trying to advocate for, right? But we have to make that clear. Um, so, and I am a huge fan of Reach Out and Read and very happy to be here and carry on with that great stuff. Um, this all takes lots of money and people. Um, and you're gonna, now we can chat and then we, I wanna get to our great panelists.